morning. I'm Praveen. The first question I wanted to ask you, if you were to give me a sense of where you guys are coming from in terms of technology, design, creative, which aspects of this world do you belong to? How many guys are technologists? Okay, so this makes sense. Okay, design. One, yes, two, three, four. Fantastic. Which aspect of design? Okay, not visual. Not visual design. It sounds fantastic. Perfect. So I just want to get a sense of how I could cater the lecture or the conversation. It should be a conversation more than a lecture. So we can get the most out of this, right? Uh, so my name is Praveen Vajpayee. And uh, quickly, I wanted to run a quick background about who I am, where I come from, and then we can take it from there. I was born and raised in Calcutta many, many years ago, as you can tell by my hair. And um, I grew up uh, going to a very interesting Jesuit school called St. Xavier's. I don't know how many of Usually, wherever I go, I find some products from the school here, there. Um, I started my career, interestingly enough, in my father's printing press. He had a small printing press, and I started working there in high school. Uh, there I was introduced to the Apple Mac, and once I started playing with the Apple Mac in the late 90s, I fell in love. And before I knew it, I started doing things that were referred to, at that point in time, it wasn't referred to as design, right? Design, branding, and other things. So I started creating um, for friends, and then slowly uh, word spread as to what we were doing, and then beyond the friend circle, and organizations started getting back to us, including things like Tata and IBC, way, way back. Right, so, we were, so me and a business partner of us, we would take any aspect of design and turn it inside out, right? So um, how many of you heard Alan speak this morning? You did, right? So what do you say that was really interesting? Backwards, right? So that's exactly what we were doing, not knowing. So that's an interesting thing. If you were doing this 20, 25 years ago, you did not know what the language was. You did not know the language of design thinking, but that's a lot of us have been doing that. Over time, we just don't call it that, right? So from there, in the late 90s, having built up a very success, successful business, I got completely bored out of my mind. So my partner and I decided we'd take a sabbatical for two years each. So that was the arrangement we had. So I'd go away for two years, do whatever I wanted to do, and she'd go away after I came back. So um, I went off to Parsons School of Design in New York City to do design and technology. And that was fun. It was great. Loved it, loved it, loved it. And so my family was here, my wife and kids were here, and I'd keep coming back. I don't know what keeps happening here, by the way. Uh, so I'd keep coming back every few months because my wife and bachas were here. And then I'd go back. So having graduated, I decided, let me spend three months to understand how the American mind works in the business world. Right? It's very different from us. Very different from us. So I said, that's one thing I need to get to the bottom of. How do I understand how they work? How do they think? So I decided to do that for three months. And I joined a startup. I joined a small startup, which is an education startup. I walked in. Their design skills and uh, sensibilities took me back to the 80s. They were at least 10 to 15 years behind where we were. It was terrible. And that was a great opportunity. So I initially said, I'm going to last here a week. I'm going to leave them after a week, right? And But then there's a social aspect to the work. The problems were very, very, very hairy, very difficult to solve. And that, once you get hooked to education, becomes much harder to get out of it. Once you understand that the social aspect of the design and the work we do is difficult to get out. And now it's 2018 and I'm still working in education. So those three months have stretched. I stayed a little longer and then a little longer. And now I live there, right? Really interesting. So uh, my home is now in New York City. Um, it's great. It's insane. So, but if you ever move from India to New York, people say you'll have uh, some kind of a culture shock. You won't. From Calcutta, when I went there, Calcutta is as chaotic. New York is just as crazy. So it works very well. I, don't, don't, please, please do not think it's any different. Just the language, there may be uh, language issues, accent issues, people issues. It's the same shit that we have here. So it's great, right? But um, here we have to talk about innovation today. And that's... You, you're hearing a lot about that in the course of the morning, right? Um, it is really cool to be innovative. Everyone wants to be innovative. Um, it's sexy, right? I mean, the way we talk about it, it's like the, it's transformative. It's everybody's business. It's everybody's talking about. And, you know, I mean, I've spoken to friends 
uh, both here and overseas. And I've been asking them, like, would you really want to be an innovative business? Would you, wouldn't you want to be the top 10? And so I went out to search which ones would be considered the top 10 uh, innovative business in the world, right? So it was re really interesting. Different organizations have different ways of looking at it. Why I love the first? Because they get these two. You've got Hindustan. Hey, you get the deck. Don't, you don't worry about it. I'll give you the deck. So you can have that. Hindustan leave and Asian paints. Would you pause to think that those two were innovative? Right? But uh, Forbes claims that. Uh, so it's, it's not just... So what is stopping us from um, unleashing our potential? Right? Um, why can't we just pour lots and lots of dollars into research and development, brainstorm some cool ideas and bring those ideas to life? It's not quite that simple. Right? Much as we like to think it is simple, it's not. As Steve Jobs, how many, how, how many of you guys are big fans? Yeah, great, awesome. So innovation has nothing to do with how many research and development dollars you have. When Apple came up with the Mac, IBM was spending at least 100 times more on research and development. It's not about money. It's about the people you have, how you're led, and how much you get, get it, right? The it is the differentiator. What is the it is the qualifier. That makes it very interesting. And in India, how many of you heard of Jugar? Right? I love it. I mean, Jugar as a principle is so damn cool. So um, it's a word taken from Hindi, which captures the meaning of uh, finding a low-cost solution to a very interesting problem. Right? It is a way of thinking constructively and differently about innovation and strategy. Again, as I said, we've been doing this. It's just called innovation now. But, right? So this stuff has been happening here for a long period of time. And uh, the BRIC countries, there is, uh, you, people know how to stretch their money a little and then a little more, right? Uh, Jugar means thinking in a frugal way and being really flexible, which in turn requires the innovator or entrepreneur to adapt quickly to often unforeseen circumstances. Intelligence in this context isn't about seeking sophistication or perfection by over-engineering a solution. It's about getting shit done which is really interesting, right? And this is my favorite, right? It is just, it's so simple, right? I mean, that's what the, the, I think the key to us thinking about things is how do you find simple problems to very complex thinking? So now, this one's interesting, by the way. Innovation, the term, when you search for the term, there are 677 million results that come back on Google, 677. So quite evidently, there's a lack of appreciation or understanding what innovation is. Then uh, the next port of call for me was uh, Amazon. Sorry, I don't know why this keeps happening. You'll have to just excuse this puppy. Amazon, um, where I had 70,000 books that were returned in my search query. That's a lot, right? I mean, I've read, read about a couple of books, but 70,000 bucks, uh, 70, books is a bit much. So <clears throat> there's a lot out there. And trying to figure out what innovation really is becomes very, very interesting, right? There are some, I just pulled out some definitions and the way I think about it, right? There were literally hundreds and hundreds of those. And they are websites that just talk about innovation in terms of what they do is collect terms and phrases from leading entrepreneurs and they publish them in, the, in their website. That's not really helpful because you don't have a context as to what they're talking about. Right? But here, it's interesting, right? Innovation is the profitable implementation of ideas. I'll, I'll, I'll go deeper into this in a moment. And um, what, what I like, it, it is an operating system that values customers over bosses. Repeat that after me. Customers over bosses, which should be interesting. Collective intelligence over individual experts, shared understanding over top-down direction. Simple rules over bureaucratic procedures. And transparency over control. So it's a different way of looking at an organization. This is something all of us want, and it's not that easy, right? And as um, was mentioned earlier this morning, it is a cultural change that we're looking for. And um, without that, it becomes a little harder, right? And there are some terms we often confuse with one another, right? Um, it's innovation and invention, innovation versus creativity, innovation versus science. Uh, the ones that people get very confused usually is innovation versus invention. Why aren't they the same? Fairly often, an invention may be absolutely stroke of brilliance, but may not have marketable value just then. 
So when it becomes a product, or it becomes marketable, it becomes valuable that way, then it's considered an innovation. So it's a nuance more than anything else, right? But it's interesting to think about that. So creativity is coming up with ideas. Innovation is bringing those ideas to life. That means implementing them, making them real. And science is a conversion of money into knowledge. What does that mean? You usually pour a lot of money into research, and then you have something, whoa, that's fantastic. And, um, and uh, innovation is a conversion, again, of knowledge into money. It's, it's like all these um, ideas, it's just, it's not something that you have to remember. It's just a commonsensical approach to think about these things, right? T telling folks that we are going to have a creative process really means we are going to come up with some of that shit that really works. Basically, whenever we talk about that, right? If you are designing something that doesn't necessarily work in the market, that doesn't make sense. A, a design has to be marketable. By the way, can you guys sitting in the corner see this? Or do you want to move, move closer? You, you're good? Yeah. So innovation has transformed the world. This data threw me off completely. In 1850, almost all of the world's 1 billion people lived in extreme poverty. Right? It's difficult to imagine. Because we had the British Raj here. They were looking, looking, living like kings, but we weren't. Right, and, and by 1950, 75% of the 2.5 billion people rem remained in extreme poverty, living at $1.9 or less a day in 2015 dollars, right? And in 2015, less than 7% of the 7 billion population it lives in extreme uh, poverty. This, this is, uh, you know, from my perspective, I found this information really fantastic. And to know that 7% um, of folks, almost 60% of Americans, spend about 50 bucks a day. Right? Why is it important in the world today? Survival. Survival is important, right? For uh, companies to survive. Innovation is extremely important. Survival in a world of accelerated change versus incremental changes. Um, it improves the standard of living, as we saw in the previous slide. It creates growth, increases productivity and economic wealth. Reduces waste, right? And environmental damage. There are many nuances to this. Innovation is vital in the workplace because it gives companies an edge in penetrating markets faster and provides a better connection to developing markets, which can lead to bigger opportunities, especially in rich countries. Right. Okay, how many of you guys have heard about this club? This is really fancy. The Unicorn Club. This is not Harry Potter. You have. Good. Give me, the, uh, give me, give me, what, what do you know about it? Yeah, it is. It is, so the, the, just so you guys know, the Unicorn Club is an esoteric community, it's a small community of companies or startups. Give me strength, oh Lord. Uh, it's, um, it's a fictitious club, actually, right? So these are disruptive startups um, that reach a valuation of 1 billion before they go public. So these guys are valued at 1 billion before they go public. And there are a whole bunch of Indian companies who have been part of that. This club has been growing a little. Right. So in the past, only a few startups uh, managed to reach that milestone. But now, the club is not as ex ex exclusive as it was. There were 185 um, unicorns uh, by the 31st of January 2017. And the numbers keep increasing. You can look at the acceleration over time, right? It started in 2009, and look at this. It doesn't, by the way, it doesn't mean that they stick there. A whole bunch of them fall off. Right, they, you know, some, some of them just implode. They don't do very well. The rise of the unicorns has implications for analog organizations. Analog enterprises need to reassess and re remodel every aspect of the business if they want to successfully compete for the attention of, of business natives. I mean, digital natives. Right, that's the biggest thing. It's how the, the digital native is a new generation, millennials and others, who use technology as a prosthetic. All of us do. A prosthetic is an extension of ourselves, right? Like, I mean, this guy, it is my prosthetic. I don't, like, very often I have a hard time remembering the numbers of my children, phone numbers. I don't need to anymore because this guy has it all. So that's my mental prosthetic, right? It's an extension of my brain. All my schedules are maintained there. There's no way in hell I can remember all that anymore. So we have all learned to do it that way. But the kids who are growing up in this world, right, they have a very different attitude towards technology from us. And you have to keep that in mind. 
in very many different aspects. We'll talk about education in a minute because that's what the college board, I'll talk about that in a moment, is an education company. Sent. And what do we do? I'll talk about that also in a moment, right? Um, over the past few years, technology startups have been steaming ahead really fast. And one, because they're lighter in the feet, they can make decisions, they can move faster. Bigger companies have a much harder time moving ahead in that direction, right? And um, Fortune 500, this is a very simple but very uh, interesting narrative here. A quick quiz. What did these companies have in common? Group A, Group B, Group C. Anybody? It's fairly simple. Okay. Um, they are all Fortune 500 companies. The first lot, they exist in 1955, not in 2014. The second lot existed both in 55, 2014. And the third did not exist, right, in 55, but they exist now. Hi. Look who we have here. Right. And what is also interesting is the lifespan. I think, Alan, you also alluded to that earlier today. The lifespan of these companies is just kind of collapsing. Um, at the current pace, by 2027, 75% of the S&P 500 companies will not be in the index. Right? So where does innovation start? And who's the primary catalyst for this? Who's the primary catalyst for innovation? Any guesses? Sorry? Yes. You, basically, and you are a customer too. Right? It's all of us a catalyst for change. Because and there's so many reasons, right? So it's the, it's the, it's the consumer. From my perspective, it's the, it's the educator. It's the student. It's the human who refused to accept the status quo. Right? Who refused to accept comp compromise. And basically, the person who goes around life treating it like the Rubik's Cube of life, keeps moving things around, thinking about things in a different way. It's really interesting. These are the guys who don't who constantly question everything. Right? And they will not accept anything mediocre from anybody else, which makes it really interesting. It is your appetite for change that is driving innovation because you do not accept what's out there. Um, if you look around, right, I mean, every day you hear of something new. Um, you hear of drone technology that Amazon is using. Drone technology is using other things, but let's just talk in terms of Amazon. It's safer. Uh, how Amazon is going about delivering packages through drones. It's not, it hasn't happened here, but they're experimenting in the US and other parts of the world. Really interesting, right? Why did they do that? It's easier. And the rate of acceleration uh, and innovation, those are the changes that are going to continue to happen. Right? Things that we feel are unimaginable today will take shape tomorrow. We can talk about that. Innovation is um, often vi very widely regarded as the key to the future. Almost everyone wants to promote it. I, this, this is going to make me weep, so you know that, right? So why must we innovate? Beyond the sh sheer joy of being cool, why should we innovate? Like, what's out there? This guy. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Right? It's a very, very interesting quote. So what that basically implies, those who accept the status quo can go on. It's fine with them. And for, in, in, uh, for innovation to happen, it's usually when we, like it's the Jugar technology. Right, that we talked about. There's something that's not working for me. How do I fix that? How, instead of driving myself and other people crazy, it's the things that people do. How do I do that? And when we do a quick fix, like you, know, you saw the bottle with the fountain, right, the shower, but if you were to scale that, if you were to make a product and take it to the market, that becomes innovation. Right? Otherwise, it's still Jugar. You're doing something for yourself. Right? <coughs> At the center, as we all um, accept it, lies the uh, customer. Because without somebody to consume the innovation, we have nothing to do. It just gets created. It has no monetary value. Right? And how do you keep these guys engaged in a world where our attention spans are shrinking dramatically? Do you know that from, 20, um, from 2000 to now, our attention span, don't you like this graphic? I've designed it. Uh, from 2000 uh, to now, it's gone down by four seconds. 
So in 2000, it was 12 seconds. Now it's less than eight. And that is, it's less than a goldfish, less than a wildfly, less than a horse. And that makes me sad, right? At least I want to be superior to a horse in that respect. But why is this happening? Why is this happening? It is because of a, the nature of addictive technology. We are addicted. Somebody asked uh, you the question about social media. It was a very interesting question. And I have a very radical uh, thought about that. I just say, chuck it. Don't engage in it. R really don't engage in it. There's a beautiful book I'd recommend to everybody. It's called Deep Work. It's, it's, it's a brilliant book. And there he basically posits why so social media affects you in a damaging manner and how people who are extremely successful have made certain choices on how they interact with social media. The social media, the biggest problem we have is interrupts you constantly, right? Is the interruption. Is the feeling of, has, has my image been liked or how has someone responded? And it's mostly inconsequential nonsense that most of us don't need. I don't use it very often. Sorry. I don't use it very often because it just causes me a lot of anxiety. When we live in the US of A, there are a couple of topics that are very high, right? One is the president, and that's enough to aggravate anyone, right? So we try not to, I try not to go into social media because all my friends are liberals like me, and they all have the same kind of opinions. And every time I read that, and it just kind of spirals out, right? So it's for self-preservation. And the notion of de de deep work is if you carve time for yourself every few, you know, in the course of a day, you define time. Like, I'm going to spend four hours in deep work. Then I'll go back to checking social media. It's a very effective strategy. The name of the author is Cal Newport. He's about 34, 35. Brilliant man. He's a professor, I forget which university. But I just highly recommend deep work. It's a nice, twisted way of looking at life. And say, huh, that makes sense. And some of the biggest uh, authors, writers, people that we know and read, they choose not to engage in that. It's fascinating. They don't use Twitter because they don't see the amount of time they put in Twitter, what ROI they get, what is the return on investment. So choose not to be there. And there's a, what is also interesting, there's a strong symbiotic relationship between innovation and consumers, right? So well, what I mean by that, innovation helps create more goods and services for the consumer. Consumers' expectations keep rising. We want more and more and more, right? Uh, the attention span of these products and services that are on offer go down faster, right? It's come down to about six months now. And that's because consumers have choices. It's a buyer's market. It's not a seller's market. It's not that we don't have choices. I mean, this is just some of the things I pulled behind you, the, the, the attention grabbers. It's a buyer's market. You can make choices because there are more than one choice you can make at any point in time. Right? So... The rate of obsolescence is going through the roof. Can I ask you a simple question? As I said, this is going to be the death of me. Can I ask you a simple question? If you don't like a particular, you know, application that you downloaded from the web on your phone or otherwise, how long do you maintain it? Yes, we delete it, right? Because our expectations of technology are that technology has to work in ways we want it to. That's the mental model we talk about. Mental model is accepting the fact that this is going to the way, work in the way I want it to because the biggest thing that we hate is feeling stupid. So if technology makes us feel stupid, we're like, screw that. I don't need to feel like an ass. I don't need that shit. So we delete it. It's done. It's really interesting how we are changing and our behavior and our galloping ADD Right, all of us have galloping ADD. Our gallop, galloping ADD is causing huge changes in the market. Re really interesting. So innovation in the digital age era is not just about adopting new technologies. It's also about embracing a culture of innovation, encouraging collaboration and risk-taking, and tapping into digital ecosystems to achieve results well beyond the scope of individuals. I don't know how many have you been thinking about this. This is something I'm spending a lot of time thinking about. There's something extremely democratic about innovation. What I mean by that, if you go back a decade or decade and a half, maybe two decades, right? What happened? We had the internet. What did the internet do to us, most of us? Small organizations could start competing with very large organizations, right? So the, the investment was not that much. Initially, they were just websites. So websites was fine. 
because it was sharing information and you could have a shopping cart and you can make a little money. Then as it became uh, more complex, you had algorithms and you accelerate over time. Now you have artificial intelligence. So bigger organizations can invest that much more money. It becomes harder for the smaller organization to thrive in that economy. But now what's happening? A lot of this work we can use Amazon Cloud for, right? Hyperconnectivity and cloud computing is again leveling the playing field. Really interesting. If you spend some time just thinking about how is it getting leveled, it is because now you can access all the back-end systems that you could not build yourself or invest in. To give you an illustration, last year, year before last, I'll come back to that when I talk about the college board. One of the things, um, we deliver administer tests. So there's a test called the PSAT. We, send, uh, we administer seven millions of those different tests, SAT, PSATs. And um, very often we have to go through dense data to pull out information. Right? And there was one such opportunity where we had um, to buy some servers. And those have, would have cost us tens of thousands of dollars. Someone in IT said, hey, why don't you try this on the, uh, you know, on the cloud? Guess how much it cost us? For there were tens of thousands of dollars vis-a-vis -vis Amazon Cloud, $126. $126. That's crazy. But that's the way it is, right? It's leveling the playing field in different ways. Who cares about the back end anymore, right? This kid doesn't. Nor do his parents, his, his family. Nobody cares. I don't care how you're building what is, whatever's inside this. I honestly don't give a damn anymore, right? All I need to know is it going to function the way I want it to. And that makes it that much more interesting, right? We, we, like, all users want to know is how can I use this technology to meet my needs? That's all I'm interested in anymore. Not, nothing beyond that. And what is my goal and how do I meet my goals, right? And at the bottom of it, at the core of it all, it is about experiences, right? Appeal to customers' reason and they're yours for a day. Appeal to the emotions and they're yours for a lifetime. In other words, emotions do matter a lot. Very often we do not understand that. And whenever we design, we have to think about designing for emotion. Because the connection is the emotional relationship we build with our clients, with our customers. Right? Even after we, what we consider logical reasoning requires emotion. Not surprisingly then, a wealth of research reveals that the emotional component, component of customer experiences, how customers feel, is better predictor of loyalty than cognitive component. Right? Functional aspects like, is it effective? Is it easy? If we meet the emotional needs, we build a connection. And then connection stays for a long period of time. It's a... I do not know there was sound in that. Okay, a brand, is, a brand is beyond the technology that is used to create its products and services. Way beyond that, right? So, here I want to talk a little bit about brand as an experience. Often we think of brands as visual systems, easy to identify a particular organization. That notion has changed a lot. So this, so this slide, part on that, this slide is uh, basically my team at the College Board is called Brand Experience. Because I believe a brand is an experience. It's not an artifact. It's not a logo. It's a lot more than that. It's your connection that you build with your users. So it was fairly ra radical for my organization to accept this. And they're like, oh, who's this guy? Why does he want to call this that? And I said, no, let me work with you. Let me help you understand why I believe that's how. Because we were going through a big branding exercise that I inherited when I got there. And it was really interesting. So um, as Jeff Bezos puts it, a brand is what other people say about you when you're not there. Right? So there's, there's a yin and yang to a brand, by the way. People get both confused also. There is culture and there's brand. Right? Culture is internal facing. Brand is external facing. And you have to somehow match those two and unify them. Because all of us, whichever organization we work in, whatever, be it our business, somebody else's business, we are ambassadors of that business, right? When you're talking to other people, that's a reflection of the organization culture. If you bitch about the company, oh, you know, my boss, my this and that, that's also a reflection of the culture. So how do you put your best foot forward and present yourself to the world? It's, it's a very interesting thing. So a brand is experiences, experienced. Experiences create emotional relationships. A good experience makes one happy and a bad experience frustrates a person, right? That's why we keep dele deleting the apps that we don't want because it's frustrating. And so it's important for us to start thinking of experiences beyond identity. 
Right? Don't just think about how do I make it visually pretty. Think about how is this going to work? Because fairly often, also, if, and there's another thing that you need to keep in mind for the technologists in the room, right? So when you build an app, much of it, the branding aspects of it are not necessarily visible as you're interacting with it. Right? How it works is of crucial import. And that's where the innovation lies. How does it work? Is it meeting my needs? How is it meeting my needs? Right? So this is another one. This, this is a slide that helped me impress my manager, make him understand what, what I meant. So this intrinsic relationship between brand and emotion. So emotion is what drives loyalty, and loyalty drives business. Right? That's branding 101, basically. But how do, what is the underlying principle? What do we use to innovate in the world today? Technology, right? A technology is key and fundamental to innovation. Digitization is shifting the vast majority of our everyday processes into the virtual arena. Right? Just a few years ago, we faced many constraints on how far our digital technology could go. Today, with the foundation of hyperconnectivity, right? And cloud com computing, there have been huge breakthroughs. We have augmented reality. We have speech and image recognition. We have uh, connected surfaces and artificial intelligence. By the way, how many of you have heard of the Babel headphones? Th this is something that Google's trying out. You've heard of them? Yeah. So these are headphones, by the way. This is innovation for 2018. Watch out. So these are, th this is really cool. These are headphones that translate even so, so if you could speak in a language that I do not know, it would translate on the fly. And when I speak to you in a language, say, if I'm speaking to you in Hindi or Bengali, and you don't know either, and so you could immediately translate the language of your choice. It's fantastic. And so, what what, what is great about that? Do you see how it's going to normalize the world? What social impact these things can have? It's fantastic. I love it. I love it. I love it. So hundreds of startups are exploring these different ideas, different thoughts, right? And if you sit back on your haunches, even for a minute, they'll have your lunch, right? Because that's what they do. They're really good at that because they're small, they're frisky, they're light on the feet, and they keep making changes. So there are some of these guys, right, that are important technologies that all of us are aware of and that are happening today. So here we are. This is what I was alluding to, the top 10 technologies for 2018. 3D printing, metal printing. It'd be so cool, right? We, we have tried 3D printing and other uh, non-metallic uh, printing. is really great. Um, artificial embryos and they're from stem cells alone. This is great for science. This is great for genomes. Um, sensing cities. So this is something that's been tried out by Alphabet Right, Google's um, the owner. They're trying it out uh, in Toronto, a part of Toronto. It's still going to take a few years for it to mature. Um, this is so annoying. Take a deep breath. I have to get to my Zen space. Okay, cloud-based AI, great. Dueling, uh, so you know, the Babelfish ear, uh, earbuds is what I spoke about. One big one is uh, that this one's really important: perfecting online privacy. That guy's really important because it's something that we constantly worry about within my organization. We work with uh, secure student data. And, uh, you know, these hackers are all over the bloody place. They drive us crazy. Right? Uh, so how do we build an innovation-driven culture? Because unless innovation is part of our DNA, it'll be a struggle. It will be something external to us, not internal out. Right? So it becomes a question as, so how do we think about it? One can build an innovation-driven organization in five steps. I'm going to really make it simple for everybody. In five steps. It's optimistic, but let's give it a shot. right? But basically, it's about, um, at the core, it's about the culture of the organization. What does that necessarily mean? right? So how do we think about culture? How do you create the psychological space for innovation? right? An atmosphere where creativity is welcomed. It's nurtured, it's nourished, it's actively engaged in. Right. So where you have the license to, to feel like you can deliver an idea and no one's going to say, what the hell are you talking about? Will you accept it? This is another question that was asked. How do you build that culture? How do you build a growth mindset? Right? Instead of the fixed mindset. 
So that's another book I'm going to recommend. Right. It's um, a woman called Carol Dweck. It's, it's a good book for parents particularly. Carol Dweck, she's written this book called Growth Mindset. Can I segue for a second? Okay, so the growth mindset. The experiment was with children, kids, very small children. The idea was there were some kids who were brought to believe they were really intelligent. So the parents would say, oh, you're such a bright child. You're intelligent. I love you. You're beautiful, etc. Right? And the other kids were just normal kids like, there are, you know, some of us. And whose parents were like, okay, go play. Do what you will. Just go. Um, so these experiments were conducted with these kids. And the kids, so the experiment was they were brought into a room and they were given puzzles. So the kids who were really smart did ac academically did really well in school. So they, they kept playing with these puzzles. One, two, three, four. And after that, as the puzzles became harder, they paused. It took them longer. And at some point in time, by the sixth puzzle, when they knew they could not get it, they just stopped working. They got frustrated with themselves. They got frustrated with the person who was administering this. And whereas the kids, who is normal, shall I say, they just kept jumping through it. They did not get seven. They didn't, they didn't give a damn. They just went on to eight, nine, ten. That's the growth mindset. The growth mindset is they do not accept limitations that other people have defined for you. But the kids whose parents told them that you're so intelligent. So that was definitely that they were defined. I have to be intelligent now. If I get this wrong, I'm not that intelligent. So the puzzle is wrong, not me. The puzzle maker, he's broken it somehow or the other. So it's, it's a very, so the book gives you very interesting tools to think about that for yourself. Because very often what happens, we have these negative voices in our own heads that come up and play this game with us. You can't do this because X, Y, and Z, Z. You know what I mean? So it's, it's well worth it. It's a good book to read. So try and build a growth mindset and find rule breakers, those who question the status quo and break rules, constantly break rules, right? Those who are not too good at following directions and tend to find shortcuts and use the product in unintended ways. See, so using products in unintended ways is basically showing it's a gap analysis. It shows you what is missing in the product that the person has to find a different way to deal with it. When I, several years ago, I was working at another education company. In that education company, the only way I used to understand how a teacher is using a product was to go to a teacher who had been using their product for three years, right? And I used to ask her for a printed book and all the post-its on the book. So the post-its on the book were her way of filling in the gap that we hadn't given her. So veteran teachers, but so this is just to think, how's the product functioning? How do I want it to function? Then I will figure out a way to make it work for me. And those were the post-its. So I take these books, take them for five or six teachers, see what was common in them, and then include in the next product. Because fairly often, when you bring them together to ask them, is it working? Yes, it is working. You know, so they'll say yes to you, but when you go into the field, when you really sit down and do you know, qualitative research, generative research, in contextual inquiry, different research methodologies, you will see the gaps. It's really interesting then. It's loads of fun. You'll enjoy that. Try that sometime. Um, break down the bloody silos in the organization. Bring in, bring in people from different disciplines to work together. Right? So bring in people from research, design, marketing, engineering, all different disciplines to come together because then you will own the problem and the solution. It's not external to you. This time, sorry. Are we running out of time? Yes, we are. Right? Um, Invite the marketing other people to just get engaged on this. Become a part of this conversation. And as I said, always focus on the cu customer, the consumer. They, are, they come first. They're the most important uh, element here in any conversation. Draw insights from big data. Right? See where your customers, users are spending their time. Leverage that. Use it. And this is, of course, for the technologists in the room. It's really important. Use big data as much as you can. And simplify as much as you can. Make it simple and stupid, as they say. Keep it simple and stupid. That's another book, by the way. Right? So how, how does innovation happen? This is left and right brain thinking. I'm going to run because I think we're running out of time. Are we? Five more minutes? Holy crap. Okay, so I'm going to breeze through this. And people, you're welcome to hang out with me after that. So this is something I'm not going to spend too much time because a number of us have. This is basically the principles of design thinking. How do we think about that? I don't know if you, any of you were lucky enough to catch the workshop yesterday. There was a gorgeous workshop here yesterday on design thinking, the core principles of design thinking. 
But the way I think about it, they are wicked Ottoman problems. How do you approach them? How do you think about them? Ask them, and are they, are they human-centric problems? If they are for the human, yes. Otherwise, there, there are other tools that exist. These are linear analytical tools. So not every problem is going to be solved through design thinking. Be very clear on that. Right? So the human-centric problems are solved through design thinking, not the other ones. And we often forget that when we talk about problems and solution, we keep talking about, oh, everyone thinks, oh, design thinking is applicable to everything. No, it is not. And it's not needed. Right? So I'm going to um, jump through these. These are basic. My, my principle, my one is really simple. The one I use is just the four questions. What is? To understand do, what is, is the basic, basically the research. What exists out there? What is it out there? What if? Right? How do I think about it? What is the new future? Because if you don't take what is, you don't take account of what is, and you start thinking about a different future, you basically, you don't have a foundation to start, stand on, right? So what if and what vows is, what really works in the market? That's a beautiful uh, spot. What vows is, what customers want it, we can do it. And the economics can sustain it. That's the wow zone. That's where the product is a success story. It's, wow, that's great, right? Um, what works? This is when you take it to the market and you iterate. You play. This is a sense of play. You play with guys. Um, you understand what is working in the market. And then you iterate again. Make it firmer and firmer. And uh, it, what, what uh, we found very successful is uh, co-creation. Bringing in the customers to kind of roll up their sleeves and work with us. I was going to jump into a few case studies. I think we could be running out of time, but I'll still run through a couple of them really fast. So this, these are more about... Um, case studies of the College Board. So a quick background. I work at the College Board. It was founded in 1900 and uh, was created to expand access to higher education. It's a not-for-profit. And the two, the, the products that you're probably familiar with are SAT, SAT and AP, right? SAT is a global test that is administered to about, overall, the College Board administers um, about, I think, 7 million assessments every year. So it's a membership association and is made of 6,000 world-leading education institutions. And it is dedicated to promoting excellence in education and bringing about equity right, in education. Uh, that's a purpose statement. That is our galvanizing principle. And the galvanizing principle, this is what all of us own and believe in. So what is our challenge? Our challenge is how to be clear the path for all students to own the future. Right. It's a very interesting thing. So every year we help more than 7 million students prepare for a success, successful transition to college through programs and services. You know, these are in college readiness and college success. The, the biggest ones are SAT and uh, AP. So I wanted to briefly talk about uh, the, uh, the redesigned SAT. I don't even know if you guys know this, but a few years ago, four years ago, our CEO decided it's time to redesign the SAT. And that was based, again, on user input. So for 18 months, we went on a listening tour. We went out into the field and listened to what um, colleges were looking for in students and what industry was looking for in students. What were the skills they wanted and what were the skills that our, uh, our test was not giving them, or wasn't checking on. So what had happened over time, the SAT had become really broad-based. So what we did was, here we go again, what we did was just narrowed it down. And we had the assessment focus on a few things that really mattered to these audiences. Really interesting work. What we had realized that students were still graduating unprepared for college based on the scores. And those scores have remained unchanged. That means 43% meet the college readiness benchmark. And those numbers have remained unchanged for the last 50 years. That's really sad. That's really hard. And so what David said, sorry, let's go back. So David, who's the CEO of the company, so he expressed this very beautifully. He says, it may not be our fault, but it is our problem. David is the CEO of the college board. He said this in March 2014 when the redesign was announced. The decision to redesign the SAT was not easy, but we had to do it based on our research. We learned that instruction should focus on fewer things done well rather than many things done poorly. Besides redesigning the exams, the College Board wanted to confront the inequalities that surrounded the assessment and level the playing field. So we also announced a partnership with Khan Academy. Khan Academy makes access to free practice globally. 
It's available anywhere in the world. And that is, by the way, within a year or two, it knocked down the profit margins of a whole bunch of these test prep companies by at least 30%, which is not too bad. Brought me a lot of joy. Uh, the second one I wanted to talk about, which I think I'm running out of time. I am out of time. Okay, sorry. So I'm out of time. But basically, I wanted to talk to you about uh, a brand transformation that we were going through. And uh, from my perspective, how I thought about the brand and how I thought about, thought about the brand across uh, every judgment. So here, what, what I have is journey map that we have created. And the whole idea was, where is the point of friction? And how do I change that into smiles? So, and this is just an overlay. But the whole idea is, when you look at a journey map, you know what a journey map is? You guys do, right? So you all of you need to engage and work together in that, especially technology. Technology should be part of product development and user experience design. One, if there's one thought I can leave you with right now, is if you can talk and think about within your organization, right? Being outcome focused instead of output, that will make a huge difference. If there's one thought I can leave you with, for a true innovation to happen within the organization, I think you should be outcome focused. Because outcomes are based on user needs, right, instead of output. Very often, we as organizations are very output focused. Everyone does their job, and that's it, right? But if even in technology, that's what we are trying to move, and that was my third case study next year, I'll do that. But um, in our organization, the, what we are trying to do now, integrate IT, so it becomes end to end. They become part of this, and I hold my IT team responsible for user outcomes, right? And that's where data and analytics comes into play. How do I ensure that they own the success of the product and their ownership is crucial for us to be successful, right? Thank you so much. If there are any questions, you can take them outside. Thank you.